Good morning, grandkids. Today is the next uh, book of Pela. And this guy fell in love with this statue that he thinks is named Pela. It's a statue of this girl's mother in a super warrior pose killing a demon. And uh, the girl says, this is my mother. And uh, his, a friend standing nearby says, Pela, that's Pela. And so from then on, this guy has been calling her mother's statue Pela. And he thinks he's in love with this statue. Pela, the name burned in my heart. I found myself whispering it in my, in my studies, even when I tried to concentrate on something the magister was saying. My lips would silently purse to voice the pale and tongue lightly flick to form the la, as if I were kissing her spirit before me. It was madness in every way, except that I knew that it was madness. I knew I was in love. I knew she was a noble red guard woman, a fierce warrior, more beautiful than the stars. I knew her young daughter, Bettenigi, had taken possession of a manor house near the guild, and that she liked me, perhaps was even infatuated. I knew Pela had fought a terrible beast and killed it. I knew Pela was dead. As I say, I knew it was madness, and by that I knew I could not be mad. But also I knew that I must return to Betanegi's, I don't know how to say her name, palace to see her, the statue of my beloved Pela engaged in that final, horrible, fatal battle with the monster. Return I did over and over again. Had Betaniki been a different sort of noble woman, more comfortable with her peers, I would not have had so many opportunities. In her innocence, unaware of my sick obsession, she welcomed my company. We would talk for hours, laughing, and every time we would take a walk to the reflecting pond where I would always stop, breathless, before the sculpture of her mother. It's a marvelous tradition that you have preserving these figures of your ancestors at their finest moments, I said, feeling her curious eyes on me, and the craftsmanship is without parallel. You wouldn't believe me, laughed the girl, but it was a bit of a scandal when my great-grandfather began this custom. We red guards hold a great reverence for our families but we are warriors, not artists. He hired a traveling artist to create the first statues, and everyone admired them until it was revealed that the artist was an elf, an Altmer from the Somerset Isles. Oh, scandal. It was, absolutely, Betanique nodded seriously. The idea that a pompous, wicked elf's hands had formed these figures of noble red card warriors was unthinkable, profane, irreverent, everything bad you can imagine. But my great-grandfather's heart was in the beauty of it and his philosophy of using the best to honor the best passed down to us all. I would not have even considered having a lesser artist create the statues of my parents even if it would have been more allegiant to my culture. They're all exquisite, I said. But you like the one of my mother most of all, she smiled. I see you look at it, even when you seem to be looking at the others. It's my favorite also. Would you tell me more about her, I asked, trying to keep my voice light and conversational. Oh, she would have said she was nothing extraordinary, but she was. 
the girl said, picking a flower from the garden. My father died when I was quite young, and she had so many roles to fill, but she did them all effortlessly. We have a great many business interests, and she was brilliant at managing everything, certainly better than I am now. All it took was her smile, and everyone obeyed and those that didn't paid dearly. She was very witty and charming, but a formidable force when the need arose for her to fight. Hundreds of battles, but I can never remember a moment of feeling neglected or unloved. I literally thought she was too strong for death. Stupid, I know, but when she went to battle, that, that horrible creature, that freak from a mad wizard's laboratory. I never even thought she would not return. She was kind to her friends and ruthless to her enemies. What, what more can one say about a woman than that? Poor Bet Miki's eyes teared up with remembrance. What sort of villain was I to goad her so in order to satisfy my perverted longings. She, Gorth, could never have conflicted a mortal man more than me. I found myself both weeping and filled, filled with desire. Pela not only looked like a goddess, but from her daughter's story, she was one. That night, while undressing for bed, I rediscovered the black disc that I had stolen from Magister Tendixus. office weeks before. I had half forgotten about its existence, that mysterious necromantic artifact which the mage believed could resurrect a dead love. Almost by pure instinct, I found myself placing the disc on my heart and whispering, Pela. A momentary chill filled my chamber. My breath hung in the air in a mist before dissipating. Frightened, I dropped the disc. It took a moment before my reason returned and with it the inescapable conclusion. The artifact could fulfill, fulfill my desire. Until the early morning hours, I tried to raise my mistress from the chains of oblivion, but it was no use. I was no necromancer. I entertained thoughts of how to ask one of the Magisters to help me, but I remembered how Magister Ilther had bid me to destroy the disc. They would expel me from the guild if I went to them and destroy the disc themselves, and with it my only key to bringing my love to me. I was in my usual semi-torpid condition the next day in classes, Magister Ilther himself was lecturing on his specialty, the School of Enchantment. He was a dull speaker with a monotone voice, but suddenly I felt as if every shadow had left the room and I was in a palace of light. When most persons think of my particular science, they think of the process of invention, the infusion of charms and spells into objects, the creation of a magical blade, perhaps, or a ring, but the skilled enchanter is also a catalyst. The same mind that can create something new can also provoke greater power from something old, a ring that can generate warmth for a novice. On the hand of such a talent can bake a forest black. The fat man chuckled. Not that I'm advocating that. Leave that for the school of destruction. That week, all the initiates were asked to choose a field of spe specialization. All were surprised when I turned my back on my old darling, the School of Illusion. It seemed ridiculous to me that I had ever entertained an affection for such superficial charms. All my intellect was now focused on the School of Enchantment, the means by which I could free the power of the disc. For months thereafter, I barely slept. A few hours a week I'd spend with Betaniki 
and my statue to give myself strength and inspiration. All the rest of my time was spent with Magister Ilfer or his assistants, learning everything I could about enchantment. They taught me how to taste the deepest levels of magic within a stored object. A simple spell cast once, no matter how skillfully, no matter how spectacularly, is ephemeral, if ephemeral, I never know how to say that word, of the present, what it is, and no more, sighed Magister Ilfair, but placed in a home, it develops into an almost living energy, maturing and ripening, so only its surface is touched when an unskilled hand wields it. You must consider yourself a miner, digging deeper to pull forth the very heart of gold. Every night when the laboratory closed, I practiced what I had learned. I could feel my power grow, and with it, the power of the disc. Whispering Pela, I delved into the artifact, feeling every slight nick that marked the runes and every facet of the gemstones. At times, I was so close to her, I felt hands touching mine, but something dark and bestial the reality of death, I suppose, would always break across the dawning of my dream. When it came, when it came, an overwhelming, rotting odor, which the initiates in the chamber next to mine began to complain about. Something must have crawled into the floorboards and died, offered, I offered lamely. Magister Ilther praised my scholarship and allowed me to use the use of his laboratory after hours to further my studies. Yet, no matter what I learned, Pela seemed scarcely closer. One night, it all ended. I was swaying in a deep ecstasy, moaning her name, the disc bruising my chest when a sudden lightning flash through the window broke my concentration. A tempest of furious rain roared over Mirkorup. I went to close the shutters. When I returned to my table, I found that the disc had shattered. I broke into hysterical sobs and then laughter. It was too much for my fragile mind to bear such a loss after so much time and study. The next day and the day after, I spent in my bed, burning with a fever. Had I not been at a mage's guild with so many healers, I likely would have died. As it was, I provided an excellent study for the budding young scholars. When at last I was well enough to walk, I went to visit Betaniki. She was charming as always, never once commenting on my appearance, which must have been ghostly. Finally, I gave her reason to worry when I politely but firmly declined to walk with her along the reflecting pool. But you love looking at the statuary, she exclaimed. I felt that I owed her the truth and much more. Dear lady, I love more than the statuary. I love your mother. She is all I've been able to think about for months now. Ever since you and I first removed the tarp from that blessed sculptor, I don't know what you think of me now but I have been obsessed with learning how to bring her back from the dead. Betaniki stared at me, eyes wide. Finally, she spoke. I think you need to leave now. I don't know if this is a terrible jest or, oh, believe me, I wish it were. You see, I failed. I don't know why. It could not have been that my love wasn't strong enough because no man had a stronger love. Perhaps my skills as an enchanter are not masterful, but it wasn't from lack of study. I could feel my voice rise and knew I was beginning to rant, but I could not hold back. Perhaps the fault lay in that your mother never met me, but I think that only the caster's love is taken into account in the necromantic spell. I don't know what it is. Maybe that horrible creature, the monster that killed her, cast some sort of curse on her 
with its dying breath. I failed, and I don't know why. With a surprising burst of speed and strength for so small a lady, Bataniki shoved herself against me. She screamed, get out, and I fled out the door. Before she slammed the door shut, I offered my pathetic apologies. I'm so sorry, Bettaniki, but consider that I wanted to bring your mother back to you. It's madness, I know, but there's only one thing that's certain in my life, and that's that I love Pela. The door was nearly shut, but the girl opened it, a crack, to ask tremulously, You love whom? Pela, I cried to the gods. My mother, she whispered angrily, was named Zarlis. Pela was the monster. I stared at the closed door, for Mara knows how much time. And then I began the long walk back to the Mages Guild. My memory searched through the Minutai to the Tales and Talos night so long ago when I first beheld the statue and first heard the name of my love. That Breton initiate, Galen, had spoken. He was behind me. Was he recognizing the beast by name and not the lady? I turned the lonely bend that intersected with the outskirts of Mirkorup, and a large shadow rose from the ground where it had been sitting, waiting for me. Pela, I groaned. Kiss me, it howled. And that brings my story up to the present moment. Love is red like blood. Good grief, what a story. So that's the end of the story of Pela. So he mixed, he misheard what the guy said. Thought he was saying the name of the mother and it was the name of the beast and that's what he'd been trying to conjure up and he did and the beast loved him back <laughs> that's so weird and tragic all right grandkids that's the end of that two book series and i will see you next time with something else to read goodbye grandkids <laughs>